lecturer wasn't able to make it tonight, so we got a alternative program. You get me instead of the astrophysicist. So, uh, that's the best I can offer. And uh, Bill Lyles will talk about the eclipse at our next meeting, which is, I think, the 9th or the 11th of August. So he'll be here at that particular time. And we've still, still got time. The eclipse isn't going to get there before he is. Now, we don't know what the weather's going to be like, and uh, we might even have snow, so uh, <laughs> you never know. So we're going to do a, uh, a, a different program tonight than what we had normally scheduled. This program is one that myself and uh, Nancy Wigginton and John Transu put together for Byron Black. And uh, Byron had some friends that, that he was visiting with. They didn't know anything about ham radio. And so we put together this program to explain to them ham radio. What it does not only talks about ham radio, but it also talks about things that we do in this club. So, of course, these photos are going to be from our club activity. So it'll give you an idea of what we can do and what we can, uh, what you can ask for, expect contribute to. We're always looking for people to contribute. So of course you watch, know where you are. Get your ideas. Talk and to you these ideas afterwards. pictures go back, not 50 years, but the uh, history of the club goes back 50 years. This is Byron, who has been a member of our club for a long time, and he goes by the name of W4SSY. Does a lot of uh, QRP and VHF work. And he's the one that we put together the program for him and for his friends. Of course, there's the credits. Amateur Introduction to Amateur Radio. And this is the, actually the title is, What is Amateur Radio? And you can see, there's Ron, our hero. Nice shot of <laughs> <laughs> Amateur Radio, and, and keep in mind the audience that this was prepared for. Is educational. There's Ron, and this was a uh, what was it? Oh, this was how to solder, was it not? It was a uh, soldering uh, exercise that we had for people that had never soldered before, and we made uh, Morse code keys, I think, if that was right. Uh, we all know it's fun, but you get an idea of the age of the that it's directed towards. Uh, building things, Altoid box, and there's a, a two meter transceiver. At, in an Altoids box. Contesting, the club is very active in contesting and we do all the uh, NAQP contests, both sideband, CW, and uh, radio teletype, RTTY. D-Expeditions, we've never been on a D-Expedition, but for those that don't know what a D-Expedition is, we take the DX out of there and we replace it with long distance expeditions. And these are groups of people that have a lot of funding, and they go out to these remote areas, set up their radio stations, and then for uh, a week or so, maybe a couple of weeks, communicate with everybody that they possibly can for this period of time. And everybody worldwide tries to com com <laughs> communicate with them. And it's really kind of a mayhem on the air, but it's a lot of fun. You get a lot of skills. <clears throat> There's one of the areas that they went to. This is a kind of a famous place. It's called Scarborough Reef. It's out in the Pacific. And you say, well, what country does that belong to? Well, if you go back and you look in the history, which another thing that Ham Radio will do for you is develop, help develop your geographical history. Uh, People's Republic of China say that this rock belongs to them. People's Republic of China, Taiwan, claims it. The Philippines claim it. So we don't really know who belongs to it, but it was really a very famous place to set up. 1994, they were out there in 95, they were out there in 97, and out there in 2007. And they would sit up there and operate 24 hours a day on all the bands and just try and make as many contacts as you could. We also prepare for emergency communications, which is uh, like, for instance, we go out to field day, and that's probably our biggest operation, but we do all our NAQP operations, our practice runs for emergency operations. 
And these are some of the areas that we have that our club has assisted in the past and uh, these various events. And of course field day, our uh, big operation, 24 hours without any municipal services who so were completely isolated and if you've never been to a field day you got to go to a field day because it's really exciting we go out there we move an entire club out there four or five radio stations put up the antennas put up the tents bring in the mess section we've got everything out there that you would need in to run a city and for 24 hours we're operating under those conditions so if you have your calendar with you, put down June 28th and 29th, 2018, and we'll see you out there at Burke Lake Park. Operating 24 hours a day, here's one of our operators, single sideband operator, working uh, through the night. And it's kind of fun because it's fun when you see the sun come up and you know that it's almost over. <laughs> <laughs> we operate uh, radio telephone, we operate CW, which is Morse code, continuous wave and radio teletype in the digital modes and amateur radio video. If anybody has a desire to do amateur radio video, come see me because that's an area where we don't have much depth in the club and it would be pretty exciting to do that. And what we're, one of the plans we have is, you'll see a balloon launch here. It would be nice to have amateur radio video on the balloon launch so that we can have instantaneous feedback of the images to the ground. Right now we do still pictures from the balloons and uh, so if we could do amateur radio video that would be pretty exciting. Field day and all the time the idea is to get on the air, to get on to operate. If you don't know how or you want information this is the club where you're going to find it. This was the beginning of field day. We had a start here so the visitors come in they know where to begin and we had kind of a museum if you look at that tent on the left there. Uh, we have a lot of um, archival radios, information on the tent on the left, the one on the right is where we have the kids and help them operate. Don't be afraid, the kids are pretty young when they get started here. So stand by, wait until I tell you, now talk. And the kids CQ or they give them a K4HTA and it, it's pretty exciting to see them. And that's our coach there. He's now in Texas, unfortunately. But uh, he was really a good coach for the kids. Uh, handling emergency messages. Part of field day is sending out these emergency messages. And we send them to people in the club. But uh, we are ready and prepared. And there is a national traffic network that practices constantly sending these messages across the country. When you hear the National or the American Radio Relay League, it's got its name from the initial project they had, and that is to relay messages across the United States. And you would pick it up in, uh, let's say you pick it up in New York, and then you would take that message and relay it to maybe a center in uh, Ohio, and then they would send it to another center maybe in uh, the West Coast, and then it would go from there to a smaller closer community and then it would be delivered from there. Now with the cell phones and things it's not that important until we lose the cell phones and things. So then we'll be back to handling this and handling emergency traffic. Amateur radios mobile operations uh, very exciting because you have a complete radio station and you can put it any place it's needed. It doesn't have to be fixed in one location. This happens to be an antenna just running up and down. That's so you can get it into the garage. And if it doesn't go into the garage, you get an immediate feedback. <laughs> <laughs> Not only from the garage, but from the kitchen too. Yeah. <laughs> Amateur radio is balloon flights. And this is, happens to be one of the balloons that we were getting ready to uh, launch. and we. This particular one, I think, was launched out at uh, Strasburg near uh, Front Royal, Highway 81. And we got some of the young kids out there. And you notice they have rubber gloves on. Why do you think they have rubber gloves? Uh, no, they have rubber gloves because you have oil on your fingers. And when you're touching the balloon, if you get oil on the balloon, when the balloon gets up 
around uh, 100,000, 120,000 feet, it's very, very cold and the oil freezes before the balloon freezes and the balloon will pop. So it most likely will not get to 120,000 feet because it freezes and it damages the balloon. So whenever you handle it, before it lets launch, it's, uh, you want to have the rubber gloves on. Moon bounce, uh, Glenn Bumgarner, if uh, he was here, he could tell you about uh, bouncing signals off of the moon. Pardon me? He'll be here in a minute. Oh, okay. Bouncing off the moon. I would wish he was here now because we could, he could be excited to see this. <laughs> but anyway, we're not going to wait for him. Uh, we set up out at the Warrington Airport, had an antenna that was about uh, 20, 25 feet long with a whole lot of uh, directors on it and a couple of reflectors and sent that up. So we were out at Warrington Airport, sent a signal up to the moon, and this was the Morse code signals. They go up to the moon, bounce off the moon, and they happen to be received by a station in Venezia, Italy. And when he heard it, he sends his answer back. And so he sends his signal back up to the moon and bounces back down, and we copy it in Warrington Airport. That's pretty long distance communications and it's pretty exciting to think that actually our little club can do things like this and bounce them off the moon. Another thing too is you can bounce signals off and you can hear your own signals coming back and that you say, wow, you know, that traveled a long ways. Time it right and you can tell how far away the moon is at that moment. That's exactly right. If you had a, a, a clock, you could just sit there with a stopwatch, right? The nanosecond. We work with the Boy Scouts. Uh, this happens to be a, just a patch from 2012. But uh, we do work with the Boy Scouts in uh, working with their uh, merit badges and so on. And uh, we help them with the radio merit badge, with the electricity merit badge, and with the electronics merit badge. And we have counselors in our unit, in our organization, that uh, do help them. Here you can see, oh, and then the bottom one was a Morse code interpreter. If you know the Morse code and can copy it five words a minute, you get to wear that on there as a, uh, another language that you know. If you, if you can speak any of the foreign languages, you get one of those little stripes for your uniform. And Morse code is considered a foreign language. Sure is to me. Yeah, I was, I was going to say, yeah, there's probably a lot of people here that, that feel that same way. Here we get ready to uh, launch our balloon. And we're filling it up, and uh, you can get an idea, not in this picture, but in another one, how big it is in diameter. But that's where it is right here on the, on the ground. When it gets up around 100,000 feet, that balloon gets about uh, five times the diameter that it is now. So if it's 10 feet now, it's going to be 50 feet in diameter. You can guess how big it is. This room is not any place close to 50 feet. So uh, let's take a look at what we got here. We have the balloon, and before we launch it, we put a weight on the bottom of it until then the weight is part of the weight of the payload and everything that's hanging below it so that we can measure how much lift there is in the balloon so it doesn't just zip up really fast. We want it to go up at a controlled rate, and it goes up at about 1,000 feet a minute. Now, you talk about airplanes running into it and getting all tangled up and everything. We hook between the balloon and the items that are hanging below it, 50-pound test line, which is like your fishing line. So in case anything flies into it, it will break and the balloon will go up and the rest of the payload comes down, the parachute deploys and everything is really good. But we've never had an issue with uh, anybody running into it at all. It's, it's only in the uh, traffic zone maybe a minute or two as it passes through the altitudes where the aircraft are flying. So it's not there very long. Pete. Yes? Oh. Do you have the picture coming up showing the peeps? Do I have what? Oh, the peeps? The peeps. Uh, yes, as a matter of fact, I do, Sheila. Oh. Just for you. But you can, well, I'll explain it because we got, we're, under, we're running under a time crunch here. Oh, okay. <laughs> but the oh. are the best part. <laughs> yeah, I, I would. I would talk about it. We have a parachute that's on there. You notice it's not deployed because it's, it's still going up. And then we have the payload at the bottom. In the payload, we have a transmitter that transmits a signal out, a GPS signal, that we can then track it.
from the computers that are in our car and it's just like a Google map or a MapQuest map and there's a little icon on there it looks like the the balloon that uh, around the world in 80 days it has a little colorful balloon with a little basket and you just track that along there so we know where the balloon is and then we try to anticipate both before we launch it using the winds aloft calculations we get from uh, Dulles Airport and then following the little balloon along there we try to anticipate and get our cars in the uh, right position and uh, you'll see here in a minute that we don't always it doesn't always come down where we think it is and here's a balloon that went uh, all the way across the uh, ocean no came, yeah RPT this is the one that went across the ocean and landed in um, I think it was Saudi Arabia but they uh, controlled it they launched it from California went across the United States across the ocean into Arabia and then they had to buy it back <laughs> And they went over and finally found out where it was. Okay. Three. Here we go. Two. One. Lift off. There you can see some of the guys right there. There's where the peeps are yeah. in those two balloons. I'll talk, tell you about the peeps in a minute. Up here you'll be able to see the curvature of the earth. Notice all the clear space there to land? <laughs> that ladder doesn't look like oh much help. <laughs> And there you can see the uh, the black hole there in the side. That's one of the cameras that's sitting out to the side. And then there's another one just like it that's pointing straight down. So you, we get both perspectives. And uh, it says on there, this is a <laughs> this is a harmless amateur radio experiment, but. You know, what would you put on it if it was really something <laughs> bad? <laughs> these, <laughs> these are some of the pictures that we took. And uh, you might recognize this as the uh, Potomac River. And, of course, there's National Airport. And this is one of, the, one of the horizontal cameras that we had on there. There's the U.S. Capitol. Uh, White House will show up here somewhere. There's the White House, and uh, this is an earlier flight. This is uh, balloon flight number three. This is 110,000 feet above Front Royal, and you can see all the way out there to Cape May, New Jersey, Atlantic Ocean, Chesapeake, from the camera that's right over uh, Front Royal, which is, you know, it's, it's remarkable how far away. And you can see a, a slight curve there, you know, certainly not a straight line. Also, we had um, worked with the Virginia Run Elementary School in Nassau, and we went out to the school, and on top of the roof, we set up some antennas, and were to communicate with uh, Sonny Williams, who was an astronaut, and then was on this uh, particular run on the International Space Station that went over the school. And uh, let's see what we, obviously we were talking back and forth. And so we have about 12 to 15 minutes from the time that the space station 
gets over the horizon because this is all line of sight, makes an arc about 15 minutes that we can see it, and then it goes over the horizon again, and we can't speak to them anymore. They can't hear us. Here are some of the kids out at the uh, Virginia Run Elementary School, and I can still hear this little boy's voice. How far up there are you? <laughs> <laughs> and then Sonny answers him back, and then the next boy asks, How do you eat up there? <laughs> and it goes right on through. So they had 15 minutes of these kids talking back and forth, and then pretty soon it blurred away. We have another uh, DVD where you can watch the whole show. Look at the left there, you can see the antenna. That's the one that tracks the space station as it flies overhead. And it just automatically keeps moving, as it, uh, automatically tracking as it goes overhead there. Okay, and the antenna tracks there. <coughs> okay, and now once again, think of your audience. And these are folks that have never seen a radio station. But here is a picture of a radio station. And what makes up a radio station? It makes up a transmitter and a receiver. And when they're in the same unit, they're called a transceiver. And that's the way all the radios pretty much today are manufactured. Uh, there's power supply, so it needs electricity in there. There's a computer that tells you, <laughs> tries to tell you what's going on. <laughs> a keyboard, and then the monitor, which is trying to express to you what this, all this stuff is doing. Maybe yes and maybe no. But this is called a shack. And it's a shack because it is a collection of these particular pieces of equipment. And shack doesn't have to be this way. It can look like this. This is a shack that was set up. Notice how modest it is, yet it is a shack and it's a communication center in this particular house. Here's another shack. This is a little bit more involved and you can see the, uh, the different equipment that we have in there. And here's another shack. <laughs> These are all shacks, so whatever you got in there, whether you have a little handy talkie, or whether you have a collection of pretty fancy radios, it's called a shack. The, uh, this talks a little bit about Morse code. This happens to be a straight key from the early 1900s, and the straight key is nothing more than an on-off switch. You push it down and it turns on, take your finger off of the pad there and it goes off and it's called continuous wave because the transmitter is generating a continuous tone as long as you don't have the key down the tone isn't going anywhere so close the key and the tone goes out lift the key up the continuous sound is still in the radio but it's not going out Interrupted continuously. correct here's now that was a, a manual one this is one that is electronic that we use today, and uh, it, will, it will do it electronically. So you hold the key down, hold the key down on one side, and it continually makes the dits. Hold the key down on the other side, and it makes DAWs. And so that's, the, instead of going this way, you just move your hand left and right, and the electronic keyer will generate the tones and you just make the tones happen where you in order to communicate. Okay, I hit the wrong key there. There we go. Okay. Keep in mind you don't have to be a ham, keep me your audience again, to listen. And that's a good place to start. Is if you don't have a license, get a receiver. And the club has a receiver that we do loan out to new people that wanna just listen. And so We'll sign it out to you, and you can get on there, and you can listen. And these are the items that we had on display. And it's uh, this is pretty much the things that you saw in the uh, video there. And uh, we even had a licensed radio operator on display, too. <laughs> and there's Byron. He was the host for this particular show. Wonderful guy. W4SSY, and these are the people that helped put together this program. Now, uh, while I'm talking about, while I got the talking stick here, the peeps that Sheila was talking about, you know, at Easter time you get these little marshmallow peeps. They would take, they, Sheila and her entourage, 
put little parachutes on the peeps and then put a phone number on there and then put them in those you I don't know if you noticed there was a red and green balloon as the thing was launched the uh, just a regular balloon put them in there and then these balloons would go up and when they get up so high they burst and these little peeps parachute down to earth and people just run all over to gather and collect them up and call us on the phone however coyotes don't seem to have a <laughs> and uh, we have not gotten any phone calls back but I think that there's a lot of coyotes out there that have smiles on their face and their tails are up. So they just don't have cell phones. They just don't, they just don't have cell phones, right? So that is, I think that is the story. Oh yes, a little bit of Morse code here for you. Thank you and 73.